the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. This is Mission Control, Houston. Ignition sequence start. I've been preparing for this all my life. Here's Porter on hard and taking him to school. What a great play by Jay Shante. KJ Martin climbed Bobon Mountain. T-minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. And you've seen tonight that we, we fought together, we stayed together, and it's about damn time, man. Six, five, four, three, two, one. What is up and welcome to another episode of Locked on Rockets, the best and only daily podcast covering your Houston Rockets. As always, I'm your host, Jackson Gatlin, native Houstonian and partner at Apollo Media. Be sure to follow along on Twitter at JT Gatlin, the show, of course, at Locked on Rockets, as well as at Apollo HOU. And if you enjoy what we do here, be sure to subscribe to the brand new Locked on Rockets YouTube channel, Apple, Spotify, Google, the brand new Odyssey app. Subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast. We would sincerely appreciate it. Today's episode is brought to you by Michelob Ultra. Only 2.6 carbs and 95 calories. It's only worth it if you enjoy it. Stay tuned for our Michelob Ultra moment segment coming up later in the episode. Now joining us today to celebrate this momentous occasion in Rockets history and to begin plotting the best course of action for the franchise, none other than the podfather himself, Rockets Wire editor, Mr. Ben Bose. How's it going, Ben? Pretty well, Jackson. I don't think anyone following, covering anything remotely involved with the Houston Rockets can be doing anything but good today. It's just, it's good for everybody's business. It's a great day for the franchise after what's been arguably one of the be- the worst years of all time to have a day like this. It's just a really feel good story. It absolutely is. And we're going to, you know, really tackle this from a bunch of different angles, but I want to give you a second here. You know, I've already expressed, you know, just all of my, the, the roller coaster ride of emotions yeah. that I went through during this entire process. I said, you know, I, I was feeling at one point, a few hours before the lottery. I mean, I was feeling sick to my stomach. Mm-hmm. I was anxious. I was oh, yeah. nerve wracked. How, what, just walk me through how you were feeling through the process. And, and, you know, once it finally happened and we found out that the Rockets got the number two overall pick. So nervous all day. I mean, I was just so concerned over what amounted to a coin flip that they fall back to number 18. And I'll save the moment, and I definitely lost my mind a little bit uh, for our Michelob Ultra segment coming up. But yeah, just overall relief. Of course, you would have loved it to have been number one. But honestly, when you went in, you had nearly a 50% shot of losing your pick altogether and falling to 18. You only had a 27% shot of picking in the top two. You have to be thrilled with this outcome. I was so nervous about it, Jackson. You know, for people that follow me on Twitter, you'll probably notice until the last day, I have actually not been posting that many highlight packages of the types of players, Evan Mobley, Jalen Suggs, uh, Jalen Green, perhaps even Cade Cunningham, that might be available to the Rockets. Certainly the the bottom line, the elite prospects, because I didn't want to get my hopes up if they were to then lose that pick. So I didn't even let myself go down the road that far. Most of my impressions were based on watching Suggs, Mobley, and Cade throughout the college basketball season and during March Madness. And I really didn't let myself go down that road until today because of fear of how devastating it would be, because this is such a strong draft. And for the Rockets to have had the terrible season that they had, punctuated by James Harden, one of the best players of all time, forcing his way out, and then not to even get a pick would have been devastating. But just overall, such a sense of relief, because as I posted on Twitter, this validates the approach from Raphael Stone. They wanted the optionality to bottom out. No, they didn't know if it would happen in 2021. They didn't intentionally tank, but as many people have pointed out on Twitter, it's very rare these days to see an NBA team completely tank. It's more just you sort of see how a season is going, and then maybe it happens later on. The bottom line is they didn't go after the Ben Simmons, Karis LeVert, Jared Allen paths, because for now and in the future, it sort of puts you on that mediocrity treadmill. So I think Raphael Stone absolutely deserves credit. And now all of a sudden, I posted this right after the lottery last night. I think it's just a really galvanizing moment for the Rockets fan base, and it should unite us because there's been just such an overall sense of hopelessness the last few months. I think you would feel that doing a day-to-day podcast. I mean, there were a few bright spots with, you know, the young core, Tate, KJ Martin, KPJ, Christian Wood, but there wasn't really the player that you say, hey, I know this is going to be one of the best players on a contender, and you have all the losing from a team that's won so much. You had some fans that sort of checked out entirely. Guys that I know really care about the Rockets just stopped watching games for the most part. And then those of us that did start watching games, it's so easy to get bogged down because of the hopelessness. And we didn't even know if there was going to be a pick coming because of the pick swap. 
in sort of how did we get here? So whether you choose to blame James Harden, Tillman Fertitta, Gerald Morey, whoever you choose to blame, there's all this second guessing all the time about the Chris Paul, Russell Westbrook trade. Should they have gotten better terms? The answer is clearly yes, but guess what? Now it doesn't matter as much because the thing that was so daunting was the 2021 pick swap. Now that's irrelevant. And by the time there are more picks involved, 2024 through 2026, number one, the Rockets are going to have other picks by that point from Brooklyn, Milwaukee, and the picks they've accrued from Washington and Detroit as well, potentially. But also by that point, we hope the Rockets are a playoff team again, and those picks may not be as valuable to the rebuild. So what we've been discussing what got us in this hopeless situation, it's not hopeless anymore. And beyond it not being hopeless, it doesn't even matter, Jackson. And, you know, I've made the point before about James Harden. Nothing about James Harden leaving is really that rare. Superstars in their 30s, especially if they don't have rings, this happens. LeBron left Cleveland tri- twice. Le- LeBron left Miami. None of it is that rare. What made this so bad was the fact that Houston clearly was not prepared for it. You don't give up all they did in the Russell Westbrook trade if you think that James might be on his way out after a year. We talked about before that they thought that the 2021 offseason was when this might really blow up if they hadn't won a ring. And then that's why they kept the 2022 and 2023 picks unprotected. What people were so mad about in regards to James Harden the last few months and what sort of led to this bitterness watching Brooklyn in the playoffs was the fact that James, it was perceived, had left Houston in a really bad spot because this was an awful year to be bad. No one thought he would leave until the 2021 offseason. We've covered that before. Well, guess what? All that we've been arguing about, is it James? Is it Tillman? Is it Daryl? Who do you want to blame? It doesn't matter anymore because now they did get a top asset out of being so bad this year. And so I just feel like overall, besides the fact that the Rockets get a building block, a foundational piece to build around for their rebuild, what we hope is the foundation of a next contender all the stuff that's made following the Rockets so unpleasant at times over the past few months, it should be done. The Chris Paul Russell Westbrook trade, it's still not ideal, but it's not historically bad anymore. You avoided the dire scenario. In terms of James Harden leaving, it's still not pleasant, but at this point, the timing isn't awful. It's sort of analogous to every other superstar who leaves other NBA teams. So that's how I'm choosing to look at it. It just sort of closes the book on an ugly chapter in Rockets history, and it allows everyone to move on fresh with the new administration, so to speak, Raphael Stone, he deserves a lot of credit. I think even Tillman Fertitta, we've talked about him getting a little bit of an unfair rap over the past year. I think he's under the radar, improved, and learned from some of the things that he's done wrong. And I think that overall, getting that number two pick just symbolizes to me that this is a fresh start for the Houston Rockets. You know, I think it. I've got two major points to bring up in all of what you just said, and they're going to be very quick hitting points. But the first of which, you did not include yourself anywhere in that mm-hmm. list of blame targets, and hashtag blame bin blame is one of my favorite things to do. So I'm disappointed in you for that one. And my other one is, I'm just going to take that entire like segment bin, and I'm just going to clip it, and I'm going to DM it straight to Rahat just to see there what he go. has to say about it. Okay. <laughs> There you go. No, I mean, I bet he's feeling a lot better today, too. Did you notice the optimism from Red94 on Twitter? I mean, it was just palpable, the difference in 24 hours, man. Yeah, man. And, and you know, we're, we're going to talk about the, the the guys right here, you know, sitting on the Rockets doorstep, Evan Mobley, uh, Jalen Green, Jalen Suggs, you know, where our guts are telling us, you know, the Rockets mm-hmm. should go with this number two overall pick. But before we get there, we got to talk about our Michelob Ultra moment. And and Ben, I, I think that you and I are going to be, you know, kind of on the same, you know, the same wavelength on this moment. But to me, there is a clear, there's a clear two moments to choose from in the the revealing of the number five overall pick and the revealing of the second overall pick. And which moment to you should we deem worthy of being our Michelob Ultra moment? The number five, clearly. That was, you know, yeah. yeah. Once you kept your pick and you got into the top four, and keep in mind, this is such a strong draft class. Any of those four would probably be a consensus number one, certainly in the 2020 draft and many other drafts. I screenshotted when the envelope was being opened and you could first start to see that it was blue and not red, blue for the magic. Man, I started yelling. It was was such a relief (laughs) that the worst case scenario had been avoided. All the reasons I had outlined that this is sort of a fresh start, that really the Rockets fan base can all get back on the same page and really buy in on this rebuild and what Raphael Stone is trying to do. As soon as 
Orlando came out at number five. That was the moment. That was the exhilaration. As far as number two, at that point, anything in the top four was going to be fine. Of course, we would have loved number one and Cade, but who knows? Maybe Cade Cunningham slips to number two. I know we'll talk about that later. But uh, that was just sort of the cherry on top of the Sunday, getting two instead of four. Once they kept that pick, it was lit. That was the moment. <laughs> it was. It, it was a joyous moment for the entire Rockets, for, you know, fan base, all the fans who have, you know, gone through this, uh, you know, D- just horrendous rocket season. It brought a lot of happiness. It was that sigh of relief moment where, okay, you know, it's going to be okay. They're keeping the yep. pick. And then, like you said, the, you know, passing four, passing three was just kind of the cherry on top because at the end of the day, it's only worth it if you enjoy it. So as you're, you know, navigating this rockets off season, be sure to check out Michelob ultra, check them out. Only 2.6 carbs, 95 calories. You can enjoy Michelob ultra as you're listening to this podcast, as you're watching this podcast, as we're navigating the rockets off season and figuring out what the, best case scenario is for these picks moving forward and that is why the revealing of the number five overall pick finding out that the Rockets pick did not convey the OKC Thunder is your Michelob Ultra moment of this week and continuing on here at Locked on Rockets your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball chatting of course with Rockets Wire editor Ben DuBose now Ben we got to talk about just the the three prospects sitting on the doorstep of the Houston Rockets you got Evan Mobley Jalen Green, Jalen Suggs. And I feel like over the next month or so, Rockets Twitter, Rockets fandom Mm -hmm. is going to be divided into, I'm going to say two clear camps, because I feel like Jalen Suggs has kind of become a far and away third candidate behind these other two guys. Other than Stanford KP, he's other still than, all on board the Suggs train. <laughs> other than Karthik Prasad, who I'm sure we will have on this podcast uh, at, you know, very, very soon to, to share his opinions and his analysis. Always great to hear from KP. But uh, you know what? KP can occupy Suggs Island by himself. Um, <laughs> he may starve, but whatever. Uh, so when it comes to Evan Mobley, Jalen Green, I'm firmly in the Evan Mobley camp still. I really think he has that elite two-way big potential. I know that so many people are so high on Jalen Green. He is an absolute bucket. He is you know, going to be a, a bona fide scoring threat at the NBA level, can create his own shot. I think his playmaking ability is a little bit underrated. He can create for others, and I think that's only going to get better at the NBA level as he learns to really thrive uh, you know, alongside other NBA level talents like himself. But for me... I look at the defense, right? That's the mm. that's kind of the, yeah. the the main takeaway for me is I look at what Evan Mobley could provide as far as being a potential defensive anchor, maybe a potential like defensive player of the year type caliber player to really anchor a team with championship aspirations. And not so not the way that like Rudy Gobert anchors a team, right? Because Rudy Gobert yeah. just showed that he can be exposed in the playoffs. So to you, where does your gut tell tell you that the Rockets should go with this number two overall pick and why? Yeah, right now I'm with you in leaning Mobley. I'm not as strong as you are because of well, what I outlined in the first segment. I honestly have not watched that much film because I've been sort of protecting myself, if you will, from not wanting the devastation of them losing the pick and not getting any of these four players that could all be really uh, transcendent talents. But I think I just see Mobley as the guy, maybe even more than Cade, although that's a debate we can get into, who might have the highest floor of all because of that defense, because of the fact that he's such a two-way force. And his defense, it's not just that he's big, it's that he can play on the perimeter. The combination of his length, his shot blocking, but also the fact that he's nimble enough to move his feet on the perimeter. Now, I'm sure some will point out, and I've had some pushing back on Twitter, saying, oh, Mobley didn't play well in the Elite Eight game against Gonzaga. Look, Gonzaga, first off, it's one game. Second, Gonzaga is the number one team in the country all season long, filled with NBA guys. Three, Mobley's 19 years old. I think a lot of Rockets fans need to recalibrate their thinking because it's been so long since they've even had a first-round pick, let alone one that high. We're used to sort of looking between like the Gary Clark, Vince Edwards, Chris Clemens. When you're picking through oh, late second <laughs> rounders other than K.J. Martin – when you're late, late second rounders and undrafted guys, you're often looking at more advanced guys in age. And that's just because the guys that come out early at 18, 19, 20 years old, they come out because in most cases, they're going to be a top pick or at least a first rounder. Now, some fall through the cracks. But by and large, when you're drafting where the Rockets have in the second half of the 2010s, you're looking at guys that don't have a lot of upside. So you want like a certain NBA skill that's ready now. You want to see how they perform on the biggest stage, that kind of stuff. No, when you're looking this high, it's about projectability. And is Evan Mobley a perfect prospect? No, he needs to fill out his body, certainly. But he's just 19 years old. To any Rockets fan that has trepidation over that, 
Look at Clint Capella in 2014, how light he was and how easy he was pushed around. And by 2018, he was a force. And look at how big he is now. He's incredibly strong. It's amazing what you can do when you're with an NBA strength and conditioning coach. So I don't look at that as much. I look at sort of what I view as the projectable upside and also the floor scenarios. And I just see with Mobley's combination of height and skill set, I just think his floor is so high, as opposed to Jalen Green, who he could be a pretty good defender, but not at the moment doesn't look to be as elite as Evan Mobley, different positions I know. But when you're talking about wing scorers, yes, they're important in the NBA, but there's a very thin line when we talk about efficiency between you know a dominant wing player and Andrew Wiggins, who was number one overall pick. And I'm not comparing Jalen Green to Andrew Wiggins. Let's not go nope, crazy. Jalen Green's the next Andrew Wiggins. You heard no. it here first, folks. No, but but I'm just saying you do have to consider bust scenarios for all of these guys because this is a prized asset. This should be the start to your rebuild. And to me, you know, again, I'm going to look at the film more, so I'm not going to say that I'm strongly in the Mobley camp. But right now, the reason I prefer Mobley between his height, between the fact that he's so skilled – on both ends, the fact that his defense, it's not just about him being a shot blocker, like you mentioned Rudy Gobert, and the fact you can go small and sort of take him out of the game. No, you can look at Mobley's tape and see that he moves his feet well. Offensively, it's not just the fact that he has nice touch near the basket. He sees the court well. His court vision is excellent. He can handle the ball even. His outside shot, well, not great. It's at least respectable. The toolbox is so diverse. This is not a Mo Bamba case. This is, I believe, a lot of the analysts that I really respect say that uh, Evan Mobley is the best two-way big, the best really overall skilled uh, big prospect since Anthony Davis and Carl Anthony Towns. Now, Carl Anthony Towns, of course, has not really been great on the defensive end. But really, when you're talking about the level of those prospects, the most complete big since them, you really have to think long and hard about that guy because I think you just have to get this pick right. You have to make sure that this is a foundational piece. And to me, Evan Mobley, it's really hard to see a world in which he's not at least at a bare minimum, a very, very good starter. On a scale of one to 10 being one being absolutely, it's not going to happen. 10 being it's definitely going to happen. Do you see the Rockets trading this pick? Now, that could be trading it for an established player or trading it to move around in the yeah. draft. Just give me your immediate immediate reaction. I'm going to go five if we're including both. If Straddling we're including, the fence. Just how dare you? <laughs> yeah. So I would say low for trading an established player just because I don't know who the established player would be. The closest things would be you know, who's going to hit the Harden button with the uh, crazy situation, unfixable. I mean, the closest things are Luca and Zion, but they're so young. It's almost unprecedented when, yeah. when a guy's first contract is going to be restricted. And other than that, I just don't see a player that's worth moving that asset for. Now, what the reason I say five, and you could talk me into six, is that the Rockets, in terms of potentially getting Cade Cunningham, they have the future assets to do it. So it really would not be that hard for them to throw in a couple of future picks I would prefer it not to be the unprotected 2022 or 2023, but you know, you could give some of your future first from Brooklyn or Milwaukee or who knows, maybe even your 23 or 24 this year or one of the protecteds from Washington or Detroit and move up and get Cade if maybe, as some of the reports have indicated, the Pistons are really uh, enthralled with Jalen Green. Or the flip side, if you kind of see these three, Evan Mobley, Jalen Suggs, Jalen Green being in similar value and as Raphael Stone has said, and I believe him, he's not really looking from a positional standpoint. That's why when I made the case for Mobley, I didn't even consider how does he fit alongside Christian Wood. I don't think you even consider that. I think you just have to get the best player, period, the best guy that you think is going to become a star or at a bare minimum, a very, very good player. And if you have all these guys ranked fairly similarly, and for example, the Cavs have a lot of guards. They don't have a lot in the way of an interior presence. So, although I guess we'll see what they do with Jared Allen. But um if they want to give a lot of future draft capital to move up and you have all three of these guys rated similarly, uh, maybe you consider that. So I'm skeptical on the idea that they will trade it for an established piece only because I just don't know who the established piece would be at this point. I can't give you a name. I don't think that Bradley Beal makes any sense no. considering his age. I, I don't think you'd go to that. So and I don't see any of the young guys truly become available. However, with regards to moving up or down, yeah, I don't think it's crazy. I don't see them leaving the top four. I truly believe they wind up with one of these four really elite prospects. But is it going to be from the number two spot? 
I don't know. Uh, they have enough draft capital and they have enough creativity with Raphael Stone that I say it's at least possible. Give me a five or six. Okay. Speaking of Rafael Stone, we're going to hear from the man himself directly here in just a moment, as well as kind of talk about uh, some of his commentary immediately after the draft lottery and kind of trying to predict the vision for this Rockets team and what direction uh, you know they would potentially be going uh, with their draft pick and what that would mean for the rest of the roster. And we're going to get there after a quick message from our friends over at rockauto.com. Now look, with the ever-increasing numbers of makes and models, it's basically impossible to stock all the parts that you need in a traditional chain storefront. So why not just go online? It's so much easier to shop for things online. You use Amazon all the time already. Check out Rock Auto. They've got everything you need from engine control modules, brake parts, tail lamps, motor oil, even brand new carpet. The prices are always competitively low. Why would you want to spend up to 30 or 50 or even 100% more for the exact same prices by shopping in person, having the hassle, having to go to a brick and mortar shop when you can just order it right to your doorstep online. So check out rockauto.com right now to see all the parts available for your car or truck. And be sure, this is a really important part, be sure to write locked on in there. How did you hear about us box so that they know that we sent you amazing selection, reliably low prices, all the parts your car will ever need rockauto.com. And we got one more message from our friends over at Bet Online because Bet Online is the fastest and easiest way to bet on all of your sports action. Baseball seasons in full swing. NBA playoffs going strong. You got the Eastern and Western Conference Finals going on, going on right now. They've also got NHL, UFC, MMA, you name it. They've got it over at Bet Online. They've got all the odds, all the prop bets, everything. Go check it out. Don't sit on the sidelines anymore. It's time for your chance to get in on the action. And you can do that with promo code Locked On when you visit for a 50% welcome bonus on your very first deposit. Again, that's promo code Locked On for a 50% welcome bonus on your very first deposit. Bet Online, your online sportsbook experts. And final segment here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball. Chatting, of course, with Rockets Wire editor Ben DuBose. Now, a quick reminder that on our road to the finals, our NBA playoffs coverage is brought to you by Michelob Ultra. Only 2.6 carbs, 95 calories. Only worth it if you enjoy it. And we can all enjoy the games a little bit more this season. Now, Ben, before we talk about, you know, the man of the hour's commentary from, you know, post draft lottery night. Let's hear very quickly from Rafael Stone and his message to Rockets fans. I, I do have a message. Um, I think we, we have a really, we have a really good group of guys already. We, we have, we have some very talented players. We're really young um, on the whole. Um, we do have a, we, we do have kind of an interesting mix of some veterans who are pretty good too. Um, but, but generally, you know, the core of this group is very young um, and we're going to add, some more young guys um, who are hopefully really, really talented. And I think uh, I expect and think that uh, that we're going to be a fun team um, to watch grow. And, and I, and I hope, I hope our fans enjoy it. Um, uh, I, I think, I think it's, I think it's going to be a, a, a fun next few years, um, you know, to, to rehash some things I said at, at, in, in prior availabilities, um, you know, our, our goal isn't to do anything overnight. It's it's to build something really sustainable. And um, and so, you know, we're yeah, we're excited. Um, I think, you know, we, we feel good about the project. We feel good about the plan and um, and, and and really hope that uh, that our fans enjoy it with us. I, I think, you know, we've been up until this year, we've been a perennial top team which is really fun, but, but I also think there's th that it can be really, really fun to, to watch someone grow into that. And, and I think that's the stage we're at now. We're trying to, we're trying to grow, you know, back into a perennial contender and we're very confident that we'll get there eventually. Of course, Rockets general manager, Rafael Stone, sharing his message to Rockets fans. Now, Ben, I want to tee this up for you because in my mm -hmm. mind, I, I look at, Right, we're we're talking, we're discussing Evan Mobley versus Jalen Green, and you know KP over on Suggs Island, whatever. Um, but to me, there's such a glut at that guard spot mm -hmm. that regardless of how they were to get there, right? We talked about some of the amalgamations of it, you know, potentially trading down and you know picking up Jalen Green or something, or, or hell, trading up and you know acquiring Cade Cunningham. Even you know, there's different you know pathways, but yeah, to me. If Jalen Green is the guy who becomes a Houston Rocket, however that happens, 
I think it means that Rafael Stone has, he's got to have something teed up or something in the works or confident in his ability to move on from one of, if not both, Eric Gordon and John Wall. Because right now you look at the guards under contract for the Houston Rockets. You've got John Wall, Mm -hmm. Eric Gordon, Kevin Porter Jr., and Kyrie Thomas. And then you've also got Armani Brooks waiting in the rings. who They haven't, you know, re-upped on a contract yet, but who absolutely showed out and I think deserves another shot at being on the Rockets team. And I think it's pretty clear that they intend to, by the way. Oh, well, there we go. And so so that's five guards. So you're talking about adding a potential sixth guard to that mix in Jalen Green. So to me, if the Rockets were to go that route, however they wind up getting from point A to B to C to, to Jalen Green, I think it means that Rafael Stone has something teed up for Eric Gordon and or John Walt. Do you agree or disagree? I don't fully agree only because I truly think that they're going to take the best player available. And I do think that they would worry about the fit later. And I think worst case that you could certainly move Eric Gordon and maybe Wall at the latest by next off season, but probably by the trade deadline when over half of their payments, you know, the actual cash payout for this coming season on their contracts is already done with and coming from the bank account of Tillman Fertitta rather than the owner of wherever they would be sent to. But um, I see where you're coming from and that they do already have a lot of guards. By the way, that's another reason why I push back on this whole notion that, you know, the NBA is increasingly a guards league. That's true. However, number one, they already have Kevin Porter Jr. that they do feel like is a guy who I don't know if you can say that he's going to be a foundational piece, but someone that's very, very good. And then they have guys, you know, I know they're not expecting him to be like necessarily foundation pieces again, but Kyrie Thomas, Armani Brooks, do they think that these can be rotation players on a playoff team? Yeah, I believe there's optimism. They believe in those guys. And then the picks 23 and 24, this is a pick that's very, or or a draft, excuse me, that's very heavy in my opinion, especially in the middle part of the first round on really quality guards that you can get. We've seen them work out Trey Mann already. I think Cam Thomas out of LSU is another guy that they could really look at in those spots. And I just think that, you know, that's another reason why I push back, by the way. I I see some saying, well, you got to take, you know, Jalen Green or Jalen Suggs because it's a guards league. No, you take them because they're the right player. That's why I I sort of threw out the Andrew Wiggins example. It's not that I think Jalen Green or Jalen Suggs is Andrew Wiggins. It's that the line can be very thin in terms of, you know, are you efficient enough? Do you shoot well enough? How good is your defense? You don't just take a guard because you see Devin Booker leading the Suns in the playoffs and, well, I've got to match that template verbatim. No, you take a guard if you think he's the best available player. So in my opinion, just sort of get back to your question, I don't think they would have to have a deal lined up, but I see where you're coming from, and I think it ties into the overall theme, which is that they don't have to make a draft pick because of a certain position. They have enough depth anywhere in that you can sort of, again, just pick the best available player. By the way, one other thing about the Raphael Stone segment that I really liked when I was listening to that video, he again talked about sustainability. And what struck me listening to that clip and really his entire press conference last night was just how calm he was. Now, I I know part of it was by design. You know, he said he was reading a book during the lottery because it would not have been pleasant, you know, the nerves that we all went through. But it's like, I was such a mess, Jackson. And I'll throw a little bit of a shout out to one of your sponsors. I went to betonline.ag yesterday. I've got an account there. And I was actually disappointed. Now, I like them overall, but I was disappointed because they did not have a prop bet on whether the Rockets would finish in the top four. They did have a prop bet on whether the Timberwolves would finish in the top three, because that, of course, conveys uh, or did convey to Golden State. Um, They did not have, because I was so nervous, I was looking to make an emotional support bet. I was actually going to, or emotional hedge bet, I should say, in which I was going to put money down on the Rockets not to finish in the top four so that they didn't and things went south the way hashtag Houston sports, although that's now going to have to be retired, I would at least make a little bit of money out of it. And thankfully, betonline.ag actually saved me because they did not have that prop bet. And now the Rockets got the pick and it even I didn't even lose the money. But the point is, I was an emotional wreck. And yet he was calm. And I even asked him, the one question that I got to ask him in the presser, I asked, you know, if getting that number two pick might bump up the timeline of the rebuild because I'm getting raked over the coals, Rafael Stone by OKC Twitter for saying that, well, even if they fall to 18, it's really not that big of a deal. And he said he stuck with it. He sort of had this projection of calm that, hey, it doesn't 
change that much. Now, do I believe it 100%? No. I think there's some poker face. I think behind closed doors, they're very excited about this, of course. But the point is, you know, there wasn't that sense of just sort of emotional. And I think with a first time GM, well, now he's in his second year, but the point is he's very new. There can be a sort of, in a lot of cases, a, a certain lack of calm that, especially with a fan base that's not used to losing, it, it can very easily lose trust and create a spiraling effect. I really like the fact that even on a good night, he seemed very calm. He seemed very measured. And of course, you hit that sustainability if they're not going to take shortcuts. And you know, he's not saying they're going to tank in 2022 or 2023, but it is worth noting again that if the team is not good enough, we'll see what they look like after the draft and free agency. There's no pick swaps attached. They have full control of their draft picks the next two years. So they can get more high lottery picks if they need it or if the team you know, just isn't good enough. We'll have to see. That's a conversation for another day. But the point is he's very patient and methodical in his approach. And I think overall that bodes very well for certainly the franchise, but I also think getting people to buy in. I like that even on a good night, he was very steady, very measured. And I think that overall is going to build trust for the fan base that after seeing departures of guys like Daryl, Mike D'Antoni, the leaders for so many years, needs a guy to believe in. And Raphael Stone, you know, I know it's a political thing, but I thought he came off very good in, you know, in that post-lottery press conference. I enjoy I enjoyed a lot of his answers. I thought he held himself very well. You can check out the entire uh, press conference over at the Houston Rockets YouTube page if you want to see more than just that little clip that we just played. Now, Ben, before we wrap this thing up, Rockets do still have two other picks, the 23rd and 24th mm-hmm. overall pick. We talked about uh, them working out Trey Mann recently. I think there was, uh, it's not confirmed, but based on some Instagram postings, it looks like JT Thor may have recently had a workout with the Houston Rockets. Who are two names that if they're on the board when 23 and 24 come up, you would be ecstatic for the Rockets to have a chance to draft? So one guy, and I mentioned this to you when we had our little birthday shindig this past weekend. I'm very intrigued by Cam Thomas out of LSU and not everyone is because for those who don't follow college basketball, Will Wade at LSU. And of course there's some other accusations of how they get players, but his system is very player friendly and that there's not a whole lot of structure to it at all. They're very isolation heavy. And so if you watch Cam Thomas highlight videos, the shot selection is not especially good. You'll see some things that make you shake your head, but the shot making quality is extraordinary it's one of the best in the entire draft and again there's a lot of sort of work that needs to be done in terms of you know coaching reining him in but i do think that just based on his shot making potential and when i say that i don't mean just his raw shooting i mean his ability to really knock down shots over tough defenders at various angles on the move He's someone that if he's there in the 20s, I would be very intrigued. I think that skill set is very, very important uh, in the modern NBA. And then I'm thinking, because there's so many others, I'm actually looking at a mock draft and scrolling up and down. But I think a guy that I really like, and it'll, it might tie in a little bit to what happens with um, the top pick, because I do think you want some roster balance in terms of these young guys that um, – that you bring in. But I think if Kai Jones falls to the twenties, if we, I've seen some mocks suggesting that he could be a candidate to go. I really like his game a little bit in the same way as Mobley and that he's a multi-dimensional big who can play on the perimeter. You can trust him uh, as sort of a potentially a two way player that has a skill set that's well-rounded. If they don't go Mobley at the top, especially, I could see that being someone that makes a lot of sense. And what's shaping up to be a really athletic front court, you already have Christian Wood, uh, KJ Martin as, I think, front court rotation fixtures for a while. So I'll throw Kai Jones out of Texas as a local guy that if he falls, as I've seen some suggesting that he might, I would have a lot of interest in him as well. All right, Ben. Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to be here for your very first ever YouTube iteration of Locked on Rockets. How did it feel being on video? Um different definitely (laughs) it helps i did do like a tv spot on fox this morning so that sort of let me get more accustomed to it but yeah god i'm so used to being able to do anything when i'm on these whereas now i feel like man i've got to look at the cam yeah it's it's tough you gotta you gotta be focused you gotta make sure you do hair and makeup before you come on it's it's a whole thing but ben really appreciate you taking the time to be here you already know the drill let everybody know where they can track you down at Yep. Uh, ben Dubose on Twitter, the Rocket Swire on Twitter. And yeah, we'll have all sorts of um, 
good content, I think, over the next month. Now that we know they'll be at number two, we'll have all sorts of uh, draft profiles of really elite prospects that I didn't think that they would get. And you know, I'm happy to say to this point, the interest in the Rockets is so high. I believe at Rockets, where it's our highest traffic day since early October 2019. Thankfully, the circumstances of this are a lot better because that traffic day was when the whole Daryl Morey China thing blew up. That was extremely uncomfortable. This, a much more uh, excitable high traffic day. People are very excited about this. I think it's going to carry over the rest of the offseason. Absolutely. I'm right there 110% with you. I'm going to quickly plug one more time. If you haven't yet, subscribe to the Locked on Rockets YouTube channel. Subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast. We would sincerely appreciate it. But for today's episode, that is going to do it. As always, thank you so much for watching, so much for listening. We look forward to having you back right here at Locked on Rockets, your daily podcast home for everything Houston Rockets basketball.